many, many years ago, when I was uh, doing my uh, graduate law studies in the United Kingdom, one of my favorite topics was public international law. And within that topic, we discussed also the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid. Now, this is uh, a, an international convention. The General Assembly of the United Nations agreed on its text in 1973, and it came into force in 1976 once 20 countries had ratified it. Now, Article 2 of this convention defines the crime of apartheid as it applies to those inhumane acts of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over another racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. I'd recommend that you uh, go to your search engine and simply find the convention, it's quite accessible, and then read Article 2 for yourself. Of course, since I uh, graduated and practiced and the years rolled by, uh, we have alongside the Apartheid Convention, the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that came into force in 2002, and that deals also with apartheid and persecution issues. What are apartheid and persecution issues? They're both crimes against humanity. The difference between the two is that apartheid is a very sensitive, media sensitive um, uh, label that immediately gets people to sit up and take notice, whilst the latter persecution is often considered the rather uh, poorer second cousin. But both of them are crimes against humanity. Welcome to intuitive reactions, the MENA and Gulf regions, and my latest number 28. Now you might wonder why today of all days, I choose to speak about apartheid and persecution. And I recall my uh, law studies and the particular convention, the apartheid convention. Well, the reason behind it is simply because Human Rights Watch released quite an extensive 213 page report recently toward the end of April, in which it tabulated with painstaking details the instances that highlight apartheid and persecution by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories. This report is also accessible uh, on the internet, and it basically goes with cases, examples, stories, legal understanding and justification, explanation as to why Human Rights Watch have finally come out and declared the practices being exercised by Israel in the Palestinian territories as apartheid and persecution. But in addition to that, what really stimulated my interest is a webinar that I watched yesterday, which was organized by Dr. Ibrahim Frehat, an authority on conflict resolution, who actually at the moment is an academic in Doha, and who also runs the Palestine Academic Group. This webinar that he organized for the Palestine Academic Group, focusing on the Palestinian National Project, was on precisely 
the issues of apartheid and persecution that the Human Rights Watch report lifted up a few uh, days ago. Now to make life easier for you, I will post in the description box a few links. The first one would be the Human Rights Watch web page for the Middle East, North Africa, Israel, and Palestine. So you go straight to the topic that I'm uh, talking about today. I will also add there a very interesting and a very professionally done short video by Human Rights Watch that explains the crimes of apartheid and the persecution and how they apply uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian context. I thought that was really a 101 accessible to most people. I'll also add there an article written by Clive Baldwin. Now, Clive Baldwin, apart from being uh, a friend and somebody I've known for many years, is also senior advisor to Human Rights Watch. And he wrote a piece on the crimes of apartheid and uh, persecution according to the Rome Statute. I'll post a link of that. And last but not least, I'll also uh, post Dr. Ibrahim Frehat's webinar link uh, on this very topic. Now, this webinar was quite interesting for me. I'm usually, I usually get impatient. I don't have these days much patience to sit through a very long uh, webinar because there's so many of them. I mean, we're all hypersaturated, if you ask me. But I watched it because his guests were really good guests. They knew their stuff. They know their stuff in the present tense. And they brought many, many good explanations to the questions that he was asking them. The first guest was Sarah Lee Whitson, formerly director of the MENA desk at Human Rights Watch, now executive director of Dawn. Also, Diana Butu, a Canadian born Palestinian uh, lawyer who has accompanied the so-called process, uh, uh, the peace process between Israel and Palestinians and lives in Ramallah. And also Ben White, whom I've also known for a number of years and who's now the author of many books on the Israeli-Palestinian context. So the whole thing was a very interesting uh, combination of guests alongside uh, Dr. Ibrahim Frehat, who basically were trying to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's when it came not only to the Human Rights Watch report itself, but also to the realities, the actual factual realities on the ground in the Palestinian territories. Now, let me not dwell too much on what the report says and what the webinar said. I've just told you, I've, I'll put the links there. You are, of course, welcome to watch the webinar. Again, I repeat, it was an interesting one that uh, coalesced politics with law and human relations. You can also look at the report itself and judge for yourself. There is a summary, by the way, so you don't be afraid that you have to go through 213 uh, pages. But I would like to summarize this report by a statement that I've got here in front of me, and I'll quote, by the Human Rights Watch Executive Director, Kenneth Roth. Ken Roth stated, denying millions of Palestinians their fundamental rights without any legitimate security justification, and solely because they are Palestinian and not Jewish, is not simply a matter of an abusive occupation. Indeed, and as Human Rights Watch uh, concluded, it is not only a matter of abusive occupation, it is a matter of apartheid 
and persecution. Two crimes, and as I said, one far, far better known uh, than the other. Now, one of the things that uh, comes to mind is, okay, let us assume that uh, we agree much of the world, certainly starting with Palestinians and a lot of Arabs in the Arab world, forget the rulers, I'm talking of the grassroots, have already acknowledged and stated time and again that what is happening in the Palestinian territories is basically apartheid. Now, if we take that and we say, okay, so what measures are there? What can be done? How can one act when it comes to such instances of apartheid and uh, persecution? Well, there are quite a few legal measures, and I'll stop with the legal ones primarily. Universal jurisdiction, lawsuits, cases in many parts of the world. I can talk of sanctions. I can talk of arms sales. I can talk of the International Criminal Court. And most importantly, I would suggest that we disabuse ourselves of this uh, unease for using the word apartheid, call a spade a spade, and speak out to the reality of what is happening in the territories these days. You know, in a previous life, I used to tell people who would say, oh, come on, uh, there is a peace process, there is a two-state solution, don't go around mixing apples and oranges, don't start talking about apartheid, crimes against humanity, don't get the uh, legal instruments in there just because you're a lawyer, give the peace process a chance. And my answer then, and certainly now is, Okay, 20 years after Oslo, 30 years after Oslo, after the DOP, what can we show for that peace process that lifts up the rights, let alone the dignity, of Palestinians, some six, seven million of them, in the occupied territories and within Israel itself? What is it that can be highlighted as being the spectacular or less than spectacular achievement of these irenic uh, processes? What has happened over the past two to three decades is basically that the Palestinians have become weaker, their authorities have become more redundant, less relevant, and Israel has learned more and more how to manage an occupation, not to get rid of an occupation, to manage it to its advantage. So it is important to consider this report in the light of the realities that are lived in those uh, occupied territories. It is very nice for me sitting here to pontificate about it compared to the lives of many, many Palestinians. And I'm not only talking about those in refugee camps, but I'm talking about those in the West Bank, those in Gaza, and yes, those in Arab East Jerusalem. Their lives are so much harder, more challenged day in, day out. So it is important to call a spade a spade. It is important to address those uh, realities. And of course, when somebody brings up the subject of apartheid, immediately what happens is Nelson Mandela comes into mind. The South African example comes into mind. Yes, of course, there was apartheid there. But there were two differences between South Africa and Palestine, amongst others, that I would like to remind you of. One, in South Africa, there were politicians who were brave enough and visionary, visionary enough to pursue this path of freedom and justice. There was Nelson Mandela, and opposite him was President de Klerk, 
who is there in the Palestinian counterpart who would be a Nelson Mandela or a de Klerk? Certainly, I don't see any de Klerks on the Israeli side. And perhaps some people would tell me, well, Marwan Barghouti in jail is the future uh, Palestinian Mandela. I'm not yet sure about that. But the important thing is to take into consideration the fact that number one, you have to have the people who would be bold enough and willing enough to brave the odds, to go out of the box, to take the extra step, the extra mile in order to get rid of this heinous crime of apartheid. The second distinction between uh, South Africa and Palestine is that in the South African instance, many, many countries were actively fighting against the apartheid with sanctions, with political and economic measures. How many people are doing it in the case of uh, Palestine? From the products and the goods coming out of the illegal settlements, all the way uh, to the spoliation of rights and values uh, for Palestinians. When the Human Rights Watch uh, report came out, remember, the United States and Germany, two robust democracies as far as I'm concerned, comparatively speaking to much of the world, both of them dismissed the reports uh, claim that there was apartheid and persecution in the Palestinian territories. Forget what Israel said. That is almost Pavlovian. Listen to what Germany and the United States said. So there is a huge amount of work to be done by the outside community, but also by those inside, so that this vilification, uh, this dismissal, of the suffering of the Palestinians is not thrown to one side simply because the world doesn't want to address it or listen to it, because Israel wants to keep it under cover, and because the Palestinians, let alone the Arabs, are incapable of mounting a strategy uh, against it. So finally, Having left these few seeds as food of thought for you, the viewer today, let me ask the question that was asked at the webinar and also is pretty much the title of the corpus of the, uh, of the report. Has a threshold been uh, crossed with this report that calls a spade a spade and, and describes it as apartheid and persecution? Well, listen. Many people knew this long ago, but yes, it is good that Human Rights Watch as one of the global uh, human rights organizations has come out and said it. This alongside a report by Beth Selem that also came out recently, this in addition to the moves, timid, uncertain at the International uh, Criminal Court that the Palestinians have seized, and the possibility of other international NGOs coming out with reports in the future as well. But what can be done is the key question. And to that, I would simply say, Medice cura te upsum which basically translates from Latin to English as a very, very popular saying, physician, heal thyself. Incidentally, this is a statement that was said by Jesus, and you can find it in St. Luke's uh, Gospel in chapter 4. The international community doesn't want to hear this message. Israel certainly rebuts it. The Palestinians are mired down in their own pettifogging uh, political considerations, or as Sarah Lee said in, uh, in the webinar, which I found quite interesting when she referred to the uh, Palestinian elections that were postponed stroke 
suspended tomfoolery, <laughs> quite a nice word. All this is happening, but Human Rights Watch provides academic, clear, lucid, legal thinking as to what is happening in the territories today. And I personally think that today, given the shenanigans of Israeli politics with the fourth uh, election and the inability of any political contender yet to form a coalition government, I think we haven't heard the last of it. And to be honest with you, the final word that summarizes all that I've said, I hope I haven't spoken for too long. I can go on and on. Others could go on and on far longer, but I try to, to sort of focus on the meat of the, of the matter. The one word that summarizes to me everything that was said, either in the Human Rights Watch or even in the webinar with those uh, four guests is accountability. Is there accountability or is one country, in this instance Israel, outside the law, above the law? Take care. And what can I say? All the best.